It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators, the famous and not so famous, the controversial and the light and fluffy, we have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Stephen Sewell. Hey, Stephen, how are you? Hey, not bad. How are you doing? Oh, doing fine. Thank you very much. Uh, where are you calling from? I'm calling from uh, Langley, British Columbia, so just a little ways outside of Vancouver in Canada here. Oh, okay. I'm looking at the pictures of, I guess these are pictures from your new film called Musky Point. Uh, was this all filmed around uh, British Columbia? Yep, yeah, it's all, all in the local area here. We're quite fortunate in the sense that uh, it's, it's pretty photogenic. We've got a lot of mountains and forests around here and everything, and uh, and fairly dry summers, so we uh, we filmed it all just in one summer there. And um, despite being hot, it was uh, it worked out quite well. And the film is now, where is the film? On Amazon? People can find it on Amazon Prime and Tubi, uh, Google Play. The DVD and the Blu-ray just came out on uh, various websites like walmart.com and uh, on Amazon. Uh, if people are going to search for it, uh, make sure they spell musky correctly. It's M-U-S-K-I-E. We've had a little bit of confusion on that. <laughs> Some people using a Y. I didn't think of that when I named the movie. I probably should have gone with something different. <laughs> well, is Musky Point, is that actually just the location where the uh, the film takes place? Uh, in the story, yeah. But in the it, story? It's a fictional location in real life. We, we, uh, we, we wanted to come up with a neat name for uh, uh, a nickname for this location that the uh, criminals use in the movie for uh, just nefarious purposes. And it uh, became with Muskie. We named it after the giant power shovel that was dismantled in the 90s called uh, Big Muskie. It's the largest power shovel ever made. We thought it was really interesting and it sounded like a cool name, so we went with that. I guess Big Muskie is named after the, the lar- Muskie is a fish anyway. So Muskie is a fish, right. And he was, and Edwin Muskie was a senator in the like 1960s or 70s in the United States. I forget what state he was from. So that the name is kind of familiar. But muskie is a type of pike, is that correct? I'm not too sure exactly what, uh, you, what not, species or whatever. <laughs> you're not a fish guy, no? <laughs> no, no, the power shovel was my inspiration. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm looking on here, and also uh, Eric and Ian, are those your two brothers? Yep, I'm the middle boy of three boys there. Um, we basically do everything together. We handle The three of us handle the producing, directing, writing, editing, uh, the music. Uh, on this project, we, yeah, we basically did almost anything, most of the post-production uh, duties, even the tedious ones. Uh, three of us are just a, a good team. We've, um, we've been making movies uh, together for years because we started off just as kids playing with the camcorder and making things in the backyard with the police and, and ninjas running around with, you know, toy guns and that sort of thing. And it just kind of progressed over time. And we started doing, um, you know, editing, editing digitally once that was an option. And eventually we started going into feature-length films. And, and this is our, uh, our second one to be uh, commercially released. Is this a common thing that, uh, that the brothers get involved in, in filmmaking? I know there's a couple of famous brother teams, uh, the ones that did The Matrix. And... Um, there's been a couple of others, but uh, I don't know. I, for some reason, music always comes to my mind, you know, with like the Bee Gees and the Beach Boys. And uh, there's been many, many brother groups. But are there a lot of brothers who write and produce film? Oh, well, the main one that comes to mind, I guess, would be the Cohen brothers. And the Cohen um, brothers, right. Yeah. There was the uh, really Scott and his brother. He, they both directed. I don't know if they ever did stuff together. I think it's been a, f- a few times that's come up. I don't think it's ever been three, though. That's what makes us unique, the fact that we're a trio. I three, suppose. yeah. Okay. So you guys are like the Bee Gees of film, then, yeah? With the three. Yeah, guys. I like that. The Bee Gees of film. <laughs> <laughs> Never been compared to that. I like that. That works. <laughs> okay. Yeah, or the Bee Gees. Um, it's interesting, though, how many people started their film career, just like you said, as kids, just running around with a camera. I was watching something last night on the making of Star Wars. It was a documentary that came out in 77. And I just wanted to watch it just to, to kind of laugh at how far we've come technologically since then, uh, when the very first Star Wars came out to now. And, you know, it, it just it went into that little bit about um, George Lucas and fooling around with a camera when he was eight years old. And aren't you glad that digital came along for filmmaking, though? 
I am because there's no way I'd ever be able to have done it if it wasn't for the digital thing. But it, it's a it's a blessing and a curse in the, in the sense that it creates a lot of competition, though. That's the one thing because now um, now everybody, everybody can has do it. access to it. Right? <laughs> but it still doesn't solve making a feature length film. That's uh, it's more a question of. Uh, I don't know, determination and that sort of thing. So that still weeds a lot of people, a lot of the competition out. But, yeah, the technology that made it a, made it possible for us also in some ways adds to makes this somewhat more obscure when we're out there. Somewhere in the middle, I guess, would have been best for uh, producing films, but uh, it was very expensive before digital. Well, that's true. It was, it was very expensive. Although, you know, to be fair, to make a really... Well, that's not true either. I've seen some spectacular films that were made for $50,000. And I've seen some spectacular films that were made for two hundred million. So I'm not sure that the money is as much of an issue to making a good film anymore. It's still all about the story, isn't it? Yeah, like some of the more, I mean, some of the cheapest films or some of the more interesting movies didn't cost very much. Short history, like uh, Al Mariachi by um, Robert Rodriguez, where he was kind of like us. He basically did everything himself. I think he did it on less than ten thousand dollars, and then that launched him into a career. Where he moved on and started doing the bigger bigger productions and um you know movies like um night of the living dead i think that was a fairly cheap movie to make and uh the evil dead there's been a number of sort of classics that just sort of took off that didn't didn't cost much to make i guess on the other hand there's probably a whole bunch of ones we never heard of that were (laughs) made very cheaply as well (laughs) but uh, they kind of lost in time well you're right about about digital being a double-edged sword and i think that can apply to uh, certainly to music and to film, where now the market is just so saturated that it's difficult to get your film noticed amongst mm-hmm. the uh, the sea of mediocrity out there. Um, <laughs> yeah. The one thing that I don't think it has affected as much is with authors, because I interview a lot of authors on this show, and they don't have that, uh, oh my God, the digital revolution, blah, 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 blah. Book sales are still, I mean, real paper books are still as lucrative as ever. Now it's just they have the choice of doing an ebook as well. But the ebook did not replace the paper book, where digital technology replaced the CD for musicians, certainly. And I think to a large degree, it replaced film, like actual 35 millimeter film, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it makes sense, I guess, in the sense that the uh, with film, your the experience of the viewer, he doesn't really know or care if it was done on uh, film or, or digitally, right? He just wants the end product. But the experience of reading a book, I mean, for me, I like to read a lot, and I, I I don't do anything digitally other than you know looking up little articles and that sort of thing. I like sitting and reading a book. Just the experience is the solitude. You you open it up and having the physical copy. There's something to that, and I, I think as we're sort of materialistic creatures, humans, there's certain certain pleasure in actually owning and picking up a book, I think. Uh, I think that's still worth something. You can give them as gifts and that sort of thing. If it all went digital, that all kind of be, it would all kind of be lost, I think. I agree. And, you know, the music purists will still buy vinyl. There is a, a resurging market of vinyl records. But for the average person, they would prefer to load up a thousand songs on their iPhone and just sit on the bus or the subway or wherever they're going and listen to their music like that. They don't want to lug around vinyl records. <laughs> you oh, know? Yeah. So, so there is a certain uh, convenience to, uh, to digital. But I don't know. Certainly. When you watch a movie, do you watch it on your phone or do you watch well, it on never. a big screen? Yeah. No, I've never sat through an entire movie on my phone. I, I, I'm not like most people in that sense. I don't actually don't really have very many apps on my phone. I got one my brother created, and that was it. Because it... Um, I don't know what it is. It doesn't interest me. Like people, um, they, they, they just show me a video on YouTube or something. They hold the phone in my face. I lose interest within seconds. For me, like a movie's an experience. <laughs> I like to sit down and set up the the lighting. You know, have the lights out and get the sound set up, and then everybody, you know, is fairly quiet during the movie, and we watch it from beginning to end. Not uh, like not casually watching it and looking at your phone half the time and all that sort of thing. I think that just it sort of ruins the whole experience. Uh, can I ask how old you are? I am thirty six. Oh, well, okay. So you're actually of the generation that would be more inclined to watch a movie on the phone. Because I know people my age just won't, you know, it's ridiculous. But I'm glad. I'm glad to hear somebody who's a considerably younger than myself who takes that same attitude. It's very refreshing. That, uh, <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah, because I agree. I mean, watching a movie on your phone is like, 
unless that's the only choice you have. You know, if you're sitting on a bus or something, I might watch a three or four minute video clip or something like that. Uh, yeah, that's definitely true, yeah. and, and the circumstances make a difference. I mean, I've watched some pretty terrible films on airplanes back in the day because that's all that was available, and I wouldn't have watched them otherwise. Oh, absolutely. Well, let's just do a rough, hard segue right into your film. Your film is called Musky Point, and Stephen, Eric, and Ian are the three main... Uh, did You guys did everything, right? You wrote it, you starred in it, you... Did the editing, yeah. all of that, yeah? Pretty much everything. We didn't we didn't do the camera work, but uh, but all the editing afterwards and all that sort of thing. And we did we ended up doing the post production sound as, ourselves as well. And just, yeah, anything you can basically think of. It, you know, and we're not control freaks, but there's a certain. Um, I mean, part of it also is for budgetary tory reasons. But uh, the main thing is, you know, you this is when it's your project. You're really passionate about, it, so you want to make sure things are done a certain way. Yeah, I think it's just natural when you. Uh, I mean, you really care about a project that you kind of you kind of have to take it all on yourself because no one's going to do it quite the way you want to do it. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on the Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments, or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of the Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Love coffee, huh? But wait a minute. It seems like every time you finish a cup of coffee, you get all of these side effects along with it. Heartburn, digestion, upset stomach, acid reflux. As the world's first and only organic acid-free coffee, Tyler's Coffee is able to provide a healthier option in the solution for more than 100 million individuals who have sensitive stomachs or suffer from acid-related modalities. This is Tyler's Acid-Free Coffee. Coffee without the consequences. Are you an independent musician? How would you like to have your songs played on hundreds of radio stations just like the one you're listening to right now? Join MusicSubmit.com and we'll promote your music to radio stations and blogs in your genre. It's free to set up your account and we guarantee your music will be considered for airplay by radio stations worldwide. Why not sign up today? It's free. MusicSubmit.com. Radio promotion for indie musicians. Hey, hey, this is Ray Powers. Don't touch anything. You've got it right where you need it. Tuned in to the Douglas Coleman Show. You heard me. Do each of you have your own specialty? Yeah, I'm the... I do the producing stuff. I'm the one that basically gets it off the ground. I organize everything, and I, you know, I've found the people that worked on the project and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, um, my older brother, his, his main skill is the, um, Kind of the writing. We have actually a really unique method to the writing. We don't. Um, we didn't write a script and have the actors memorize it. Instead, uh, we came up with extremely detailed plot outlines with character motivation and backstories and that sort of thing. And um, we had the actors improvise. And my brother Ian watched all the footage and he transcribed all the dialogue. And then cutting and pasting, he formed together a coherent editing script and then passed it off to my brother Eric, who's the editor. That's his main thing. And he edited the movie based on that. And then in the end, we ended up with... Um, We've gotten some positive feedback on the dialogue as a result, I think, because one person didn't write every line in the movie. The actors kind of, um, each each character has his own sort of unique uh, style of dialogue, and the reactions that the actors have to each other are very genuine, because they don't know exactly what their co-star is going to say. So it ended up turning out that way. It was pretty pretty neat. But that that's my brother Ian's main uh, main sort of contribution. And as I said, my brother Eric does the editing, and he uh, wrote all the music for the film as well. You know, that is a great idea with the uh with the dialogue has that been done before 
I don't know if they do it the same way we do. I've heard of films where they, um, in rehearsals, they'll improvise and then they'll, they'll form a script based on what they, uh, when I mean, they record the rehearsals, but they're just done in like a room or something. And then they'll form a script based on that. But I know there's lots, of, like a lot of my favorite movies actually have, have relied heavily on improvisation. Um, like Dog Day Afternoon from, with Al Pacino from 1976, yeah. I think. That film there, I, I heard that the whole thing was pretty much improvised. And you can kind of tell by the way that people are talking in the movie, the slight interruptions between each other and that sort of thing. You don't usually find that in a, just a standard sort of script. And I know Scorsese uses a lot of improvisation. I think he's used it in movies like Goodfellas and uh, stuff like Wolf of Wall Street and those sort of things, uh, those sort of films. And that I just think it adds a certain uh, realism to it. it, makes it more fun to work on, too, because, as I said, the actors get to be creative. And uh, they're not just, uh, you know, sort of a cog in a machine, right? They're actually kind of contributing to the creative process. I wonder if that takes away from the, uh, the screenwriters at all in terms of their ego. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine so. Yeah, they wouldn't want to be put out of the job if this if this were a style that were to take off or something like that. Yeah, they could be nervous about this. This could be like the karaoke machine coming in and replacing the live bands in clubs and bars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I don't know. We'll start a sort of a, a writing revolution in movies. I guess doing it this way. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see what happens. But I mean, I just thinking about it. I like that idea because it obviously would make the conversations between people seem more real because people aren't perfectly scripted in life that's just not the way people talk to each other people go uh and they stop and they think and they they try to maybe they backpedal if they said something they they shouldn't have and it um it, it just yeah I, I i could see where it would make it a much more natural realistic feeling to the to the dialogue yeah yeah, yeah, that's how it, that's how it appears to us. And um, what uh, what's nice about it too is from a uh, just from a production standpoint is you don't um, it's very efficient in the sense that you don't if you've got memorized scripts and the actors are flubbing their lines every one of those takes is virtually useless. But here we don't have a useless take. Every single take will give you some original useful content because you're just recording and maybe right. they go in a weird direction they're not they're getting off topic. We just sort of guide them with the directing we're like okay guys just a second. Uh, so maybe don't talk about that so much. Maybe move more onto this. And the guys go, okay. And they just sort of pick up where they left off. But basically, every every hour of footage will at least have some useful stuff in it. Right. And then you can just cut it all together, and it it'll work. Um, it's yeah. it's different than. Well, I don't know if you could do that with music. Like if you had a jazz band, and everybody did their bits, and then you'd have to try to weave it, <laughs> weave it together. I think that'd be really hair pulling. But I think with dialogue, you could do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, with music, that'd be a little difficult in post production. But yeah. this is like, bands like the Grateful Dead, they, they kind of do it on the fly. Or they did anyway back in the day. But well, they that's true. Improvised yeah. with the Almond Brothers. Yeah, some pretty neat stuff. I don't know how they do that. It's fascinating to me. I'm, I'm not a musician. My brothers are, but I'm not. I don't know how they do that. How they but do? Amazing. How they what? Improvise? Yeah, with, with musicians. How do they? I mean, they just nod to each other. How do they know when they're changing to the? off the chorus into this part or that. I don't know. It's fascinating. Uh, well, they do nod to each other if they're going to change, but generally they stay within a parameter of oh, okay. of two or three chords, you know, and they just repeat over and over and over and over again. But there's always a melody within a melody within a melody within a melody amongst those three chords. So as long as you've got the structure right, you can just go on and on forever. And then, you know, they change instruments. Like, okay, the guitar is going to do it now. Now the piano is going to do it. Now the trumpet's going to do it. But it's the same same parameter. And if they're going to go change to something, then somebody nods to somebody and says, you know, da, 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 and then they go, they change into the the verse or whatever. But that usually doesn't happen. Well, it wanna... looks pretty amazing when they do it. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it is amazing because you've got to be able to come up with a completely different melody to the the foundation that you have. Do you know what I mean? Well, we're getting way off topic here. Uh, let's get back <laughs> to your film, Musky Point. Why don't you give us about a one-minute synopsis, if you can? Sure, okay. It's a, um, Musky Point's a, it's a crime drama about a prisoner handoff between two separate crews that both work for a, a larger criminal syndicate, which is run by their the big boss named Mr. Mannerix. Now, Mr. Max has discovered that one of his subordinates named Doyle has been earning on the side without paying tribute, so he's ordered Doyle's crewmates to apprehend him and surrender him over for punishment, and this is all going to go down at Muskie Point, which is, as I mentioned, is a 
is a remote mountain location that they use. And uh, those crewmates are torn because they feel a certain amount of loyalty to him, but they also don't want to disobey their boss, and he is guilty after all. So the film takes place in real time, and it just covers all the events surrounding this meeting at Muskie Point. Okay. Well, that was good. Do you have a website for the film or for yourself that you want to give out? Uh, people should, uh, tubi.com, T-U-B-I.com is probably the, uh, you can watch it for free on there, actually. I think it has ads and stuff. Uh, that'd be the best place to look for the film. And then, and then the IMDb page would also be good for um, just finding out information on information on it or if you want, people want to watch the trailer and that sort of thing. Um, and if they got Amazon Prime memberships, that's, that's an easy way to watch it as well. Okay. How long has the film been out? Uh, it's been out a few months now. Um, uh, it just came out on DVD and Blu-ray uh, within the last few weeks, but it's been on video on demand since late last year. Do you get a, a report of some kind that shows how many people uh, streamed it? Uh, I will. I don't have anything like that yet. I mean, we have a distributor that handles all that um, based out of Los Angeles there, and they um, they set up the deals with Amazon. They do all that sort of stuff for them. We, we, it was kind of like a music label, right? You sign a contract with them. And uh, so they have all that information. I haven't seen anything on that yet, but I, I'm pretty sure I can get it. It'd be, it'd be pretty interesting to see, because right? I don't know exactly what the royalties are, like how much you get per view, but it'd be, it'd be pretty interesting to find out. And last question is, you, you mentioned Blu-ray and DVD. Is that a really viable market anymore? I don't know if it is. Um, well, we'll see as it goes along. But, uh, I mean, I don't really know people that... I mean, some people still buy them, I think. Like, you go into Walmart or something, you'll see like, a stack of them in a bin, yeah. but... I mean, I'm weird. I don't, as I said, I, I don't use my phone for much. I mean, I, I still get DVDs, um, but it's never a current film. It's always some obscure older film. I'll buy them on DVD because it's, it's just an easy way to get them because the streaming services might not have it available. But, um, yeah, I don't know about Blu-ray because I don't know if that really ever took off too much. I'm not sure. I, I don't know anybody that really buys them. <laughs> I have one Blu-ray disc, and that was Avatar. And that oh, was, yeah, yeah. You know, that was the only one I ever bought, and I thought, oh, wow, that looks good. And I never bought another one, you know, so I don't know. It certainly has a nice picture, but um, I think now with 4K TV, just about anything looks as good, you know? Oh, yeah, that changes everything. I mean, yeah, our, our film is recorded entirely in 4K. It's just amazing what uh, how crisp those images look. Your whole film is in 4K? Wow. Yeah, I don't think any of those services I mentioned, like Amazon or, or, or Tubi or anything, there's just no 4K platforms right now that no. it's on. Um, they're hoping to get some uh, going because there isn't that much in the video on demand world for 4K yet. But but the, just having the original um, source material in 4K really gave us something to work with because if you scale it down for, say, DVD or Blu-ray, it still looks quite crisp. Well, the the funniest part about, I think, 4K is that right now there wouldn't be very many people who would even have fast enough internet to stream it. Exactly, yeah. I mean, those files are... <laughs> How big was the file for for a 4K for a, what is it, an hour and a half movie? Oh, it was just humongous. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but we have these, we bought these huge hard drives, which is like, you know, like a, they hold like a terabyte or something just to just to support it. That's, that is a big challenge when you're editing a film is nowadays because the video, it's just so big. Everything's so huge. But, um, yeah, we've got these big big hard drives backing it all up right now. Well, we got to wrap this up. Uh, thank you so much for coming on, and uh, best of luck with the film. The film is called Muskie Point, and check it out on Amazon and where else? Uh, Tubi, T-U-B-I, uh, Tubi.com, and um, Google Play. Um, and then, yeah, if people want DVD or Blu-ray, they're into physical media, they can find that at a variety of stores online. Great. Stephen, thanks so much for coming on the show. It was nice talking to you. Best of luck. I really appreciate it.